Welcome back to the Our View Podcast. On today's episode, I welcome my guest, Melissa Petrillo. Melissa is a special education teacher who majored in special education with a concentration in English. Join our conversation as we discuss the importance of disability representation in children's literature. I am so, so thankful that you were able to uh, join me for this episode, and I, um, I start all of my episodes off by asking my guests to introduce themselves, because, um, you know, I can read about you, or you can tell me things about you, but, you know, you can best introduce yourself and tell everybody who you are and what you want them to know about you. <laughs> Sure thing. So um, I'm 28 years old. I'm from West Orange, New Jersey. I am recently a wife as of 2019. I'm a daughter. I'm a sister. Um, This is my seventh year as a special education and English teacher in Nutley Public Schools. And I absolutely love it. My students inspire me so much and I enjoy working with them every day. As a teacher, I've worked in a resource room. I've taught inclusion classes. Currently, I teach self-contained classes. So I'm so thankful that I have so much experience. I received my education degree from Caldwell University, which is a small local college in Caldwell. And my degree was in education, but they required every student to pick a second major, a content area. So I picked English and I'm so happy I did because it's played such a major part in my life, which is great. And then uh, I also went to earn my master's degree there in education administration and leadership. And the way that I really got interested in this topic about disabilities in children's literature is because through a program when I was in my undergraduate career, I had the freedom to pick a topic I want to conduct research on. You know, we were encouraged, okay, try to combine the majors. So I remember sitting in the library on the computer, on the database, and I was looking for all different articles about education. Then I was writing education, autism, education, special education. All of a sudden, a topic came up about the neglected topic of disabilities in children's literature. And right away, I just thought, I need to find out more about this. And that's how I've been doing some research since then. And I'm so fortunate right now, I'm in the process of publishing a book that hopefully should be out in 2021. That's awesome. That, that's so great. I'm always interested in hearing, uh, you know, people's uh, career paths and how they got into uh, that specific career path. And um, for you being a, a teacher, how, what made you want to become a teacher and especially uh, like a special education teacher? Is there any yeah, one sure. thing? <laughs> yeah, so you know what? It really was one of that that inspired me. When I was in high school, we had a service hour requirement, which I think as a high school teacher is so great. We always want to encourage our students to do service. So we used to have the opportunity to complete hours over the summer for the following school year. So my best friend said to me, she's like, you know what, let's start looking at some places where we can find some service hours. It's a great idea. Love that. So here she ended up looking for some opportunities. And one was at Camp Hope that's run through the Arc of Essex County. And this is a camp for individuals of different ability levels, ranging from preschool through adults. So it was, we were there for one week and immediately I loved it. I felt like working with all these individuals, they just shine such a positive light. And it was so rewarding because they truly, when people think of summer camp, they're like, oh, it must be hard to be a counselor. You know, no one wants to be there. It's in the heat of the summer. But really it was amazing. They were just as happy to be there as we were. And right after that week, my best friend and I were thinking, all right, we're gonna work there next year. We ended up working there for over eight years, which was wow. great. <laughs> yeah, 
time, right? So we were, you know, lifers. We loved working there every summer. And my best friend, she's a special education teacher as well. So, you know, that really helped us find our career paths. Wow. That is, it reminds me of, um, with uh, Bill Jake's place, uh, the, the nonprofit I work for, we operate a Miracle League, which is a baseball league for children and adults with disabilities. And um, we have a group of students from a local high school that uh, came out one day. It was, I think there were four or five of them that came out because uh, one of their sisters had heard me speak in their school, in their classroom. And they went home and talked about it and they said, well, you know, we have to, you know, we have to go to this Jake's Place playground and we have to, you know, they, they do a baseball league too. And this was a, someone's younger sister in, in fifth or sixth grade. And they told their uh, brother about it and the brother told their friends and they brought four students out. And, and then all of a sudden, you know, they started a club, their teachers were on strike. So they, <laughs> so they didn't even have like the supervision of a, of a, uh, you know, a teacher. They started the club on their own. Um, they invited me to their first meeting. They had over a hundred students that showed up for this club meeting. And, you know, very surprisingly, one of the um, students that, <laughs> one of the students that started the club uh, just texted me the other day and she said, hey, I'm graduating in a few weeks. And I was like, what? <laughs> From college. <laughs> amazing. That is yeah. so amazing. Oh, I'm like, wait, amazing. what? <laughs> like, where, did, where did the years go? Wait a minute. What do you mean you're graduating from college? Like, I don't How know. How did you grow up that fast? Yeah, I was like, no, wait, because that means I'm getting older too. No. <laughs> that doesn't make us feel our age at all, right? We'll right. Hear that. <laughs> yeah, I was like, wow. So it, it really, you know, so, so hearing you say that you, you know, you had the service hours, which was the same for these students and, you know, you can do service hours anywhere, you know, you can, you know, you have many options to do the service hours. And it's the fact that you chose the Camp Hope and, and they chose uh, the students I'm, I'm referring to chose the Miracle League. And they, you know, and, and like you said, you went back every summer and the same thing with these students, they, you know, they, they attend college over in Philadelphia and they come back on Saturday mornings. I'm like, we play on Saturday mornings at 10 AM. Why are you not sleep? Like, <laughs> Why are you not in bed? <laughs> right. Like, <laughs> you should have been out late last night and sleeping on Saturday. Like, why are you here? <laughs> like, oh, because we love it. You know, it's a great time and, you know, we enjoy it. And I'm like, I appreciate it, but my goodness. <laughs> like, you can take a break. Like, it's okay. <laughs> Good for them. But that is so awesome. Really. Yeah, it, it's really great when you, when you find something that, um, that you're passionate about and it really touches you in such a way that you want to, uh, you want to stick with it. And, and that's really, that's re really says a whole lot about, uh, you know, the place where you, where you were going to the camp, where you were going, that you kept going back. And, and as you said, like in your, your summertime, it's, uh, <laughs> and you know, we have so many fun memories from there, right. you know, my friend and I will still talk about it. It was just so great. And I think for both of us, you know, and similar I'm sure to you with schools when we were attending school a lot of times it was you're in one class or you're in the other class now inclusion classes are more available which is great so students mm -hmm. have a greater idea of what is going on and more awareness but I think that was our first time interacting with individuals with different ability levels especially as young adults you know we really right it raised a huge sense of awareness for us that really changed our lives. You know, we didn't never turn back after that point. We consistently try to advocate. Yeah, that's, that's so, so great. And uh, the fact that you, you know, turn that into your career path of being a teacher and uh, now you, you have gotten into, uh, I, I guess you could say researching the, um, the characters with disabilities in literature. And that was uh, such a great topic that I was excited to, um, to talk about because come, growing up as a child, I didn't see, you know, I'm African-American, so it was rare to see, 
you know, African American uh, books and, and characters in books and, and on TV, and, and even more rare to see African Americans who have disabilities in books and on TV. So, um, you know, the fact that it, it is getting a whole lot better, and there are some uh, books and, and that exist now that have uh, main characters that have uh, some type of disabilities. I, I believe the book was called Wonder that was out a couple of years ago and they turned it into a movie, which was great. The book was great. The movie was great. <laughs> I loved it, right? That's yes. one of my favorites for sure. Yes, I, I loved it so much. One of the, um, I speak to a, a sixth grade class every year and they, um, it was part of their required reading over the summer. And I usually go in October and uh, the year they had to read it for their summer, uh, their summer reading, they, you know, one of the students told me about it. And I said, oh, I'll have to read it. And I did. And it was like, wow, this is a really, <laughs> really great book. <laughs> yes. And I do think, you know, that book was so popular. And as you said, it was turned into a movie that really helped students see like, okay, we can see characters with different ability levels, mm -hmm. in books, you know, which is so great. Yeah, it really does. And it, it really, it, it, for me, I think that book, uh, that book especially, um, you know, really brought home to what I like to tell students all the time is that, you know, kids with different abilities, kids with disabilities, they like to do a lot of the same things that you do. And, you know, through that story, it was just like, yeah, he was just a regular kid that liked to do things and have friends and play and, and do everything everybody else wanted to do. So I, I think that's what, um, I think what books do and, uh, you know, literature and reading, I think that helps uh, bring some commonality to everybody and, and everybody is, uh, you know, very similar in, you know, in a book and, and you get to see the whole, uh, you know, the whole character, the whole person as, as a whole. And, uh, you know, so I think that's, that's what that book really did, really showed for me. But um, can you, can you discuss a little bit about, you um, like the history of characters with disabilities in literature and um, I guess the progression of how it, it went from, you know, there not being many to there being a lot more now and, and still where, you know, where it has to go. Definitely. So really what's so interesting is when I did this research, so much of the history of characters with disability mirrored society's ideas at the time. So Originally, as I said earlier, this was a neglected topic, right? There really, for a time, were not any books. Like you said, growing up, like where is a character that is going through the same experiences as me, right? And we want to make sure that there are books available because I say so often that books do serve as mirrors you know, students are thinking, where's a character who feels the way I feel? Why aren't they going through the experiences I have? So really prior to the 19th century, characters with disabilities were portrayed negatively in society or as a burden. And unfortunately that was echoing society's views. But now society is recognizing the achievements of children and young adults with disabilities through literature, which is wonderful. But we want to make sure that the literature we are reading is well written. So just before I talk about how we know it's well written, just a little bit of history. So prior to the 1700s, right, really students who had disabilities were sent to specialty schools. So they weren't interacting with their peers. So specialty schools were created and texts that were made a very limited amount just were to evoke sympathy from readers. Like, oh, okay, they're different than me, and I want to make sure I'm understanding that. But then within the 1800s, physical impairments became more prominent just in society. So books were addressing that, but the way they were addressing it was they were saying that characters would receive cures for their good deeds, right? And we know that's not realistic. <laughs> so we don't want to read those books to children, young adults. Then within the 1900s, that's when more cognitive impairments 
were beginning to be addressed in young adult literature. So I always reference, you know, when I first started teaching, books like To Kill a Mockingbird by Harper Lee and A Mice and Men by John Steinbeck. You can have that conversation about disabilities with young adults using those books. Those books per se are not just about disabilities and the historical context is completely different than present day, but those are some of our first texts that you're thinking, okay, finally, this topic is addressed. And then within the 2000s, there are more, um, there's a stronger availability of children's literature, but we need to have access to more diverse texts. And that brings me to a discussion about our evaluative criteria. So we want to think about, first of all, we need to have books that address a wide range of disabilities. So we're talking about autism, we're talking about Down syndrome, we're talking about physical impairments, hearing impairments, learning disabilities, ADHD, right? Things that are so common in our society, but sadly, there's not enough books available for students who this is their ability level and they want to see a character going through the same thing. So anytime that we're looking at a book right now, we want to make sure that it avoids stereotypes. That is the biggest thing because we don't want the author to say, you know, everyone with Down syndrome is like this or everyone who has a learning disability thinks this. So right now, more of the characters with disabilities are being portrayed in a positive light, which is great. And we want to make sure that it's showing a range of disabilities. There should be no stereotypes. Really, the strengths should be highlighted of those with disabilities. And just as you said, we want to make sure that it shows the diversity of disability demographics. And as I'll mention later, when I talk more about my book, when I did my research, most of the books were about males. There were not a lot of books about female characters who had a disability. And the books that were written were predominantly about Caucasian males, or they were, there was a few texts about African-American males, but we have our other populations, such as my character is an Asian-American biracial female. You know, someone who is Asian American and has autism and thinks, I want to read a book about a girl like me, you know, we shouldn't have to force children to search high and low. Now they have the internet, which is great, but, you know, there should be texts that they can go to their library and say, okay, I want to read a book about someone like me and be able to pull it off the shelf. I love all of what you just said. <laughs> Sorry, it was a lot. <laughs> no, it was it was great because, and I'm I'm glad you mentioned uh, To Kill a Mockingbird. That was one of my favorite books, uh, reading in high school, and it was, um, you know, again, it, it mentioned like the disability, and it, uh, you know, it it talked about it a little bit, just just enough to, you know, let you know that something, you know, something was there. Uh, you know, and it was like, oh, wait, like that, that's what's going on here. And that, that's what I really, um, I, I love that book. It was one of my favorite books to read uh, growing up. And the diversity piece that you just mentioned is so, so important. And, um, you know, the fact that, that the character in your book is um, an Asian and you said uh, biracial, right? That's it. So that's like, yeah. and that's what, and, and that's the, that's the thing of, of what you also said that, you know, the books reflected society at the time, you know, and, and uh, just, you know, from not, them not existing. And because at that time they were often, people with disabilities were often hidden and sent to schools away from home, uh, you know, to, to coming up to present day where, you know, hopefully you can see uh, more stories of people with disabilities and, and their strengths being highlighted and, uh, avoiding the stereotypes was another good, uh, really good point that, uh, you know, that you mentioned, because I, I always tell people, like, I have spina bifida, and there are so many people that have spina bifida, and every single one of us is different. <laughs> you know, sure. I, I use a wheelchair, but I can also walk with my braces and my crutches. Uh, you know, so I always tell the kids whenever I speak in schools, I said, you see me in my wheelchair today, but you might see me this weekend walking 
you know, in a park or at, at the mall or something, don't be afraid. Like it, it's, you know, I still, <laughs> I still have spina bifida, but it's just, uh, you know, it's just different for me and it's different for everybody because there are some people who have spina bifida that uh, can't get out of their wheelchair. They have to use it as their primary uh, source of uh, mobility. So uh, to not stereotype as, you know, blanket statements of everybody who has this type of disability is this way or acts this way or, uh, you know, has this, uh, has the same type of diagnosis as everyone else, I think is a really key uh key point for sure. Yeah. I completely agree. And you know, it's so important. We do have that conversation and that's something I tried to show in my book. You know, I have autism and some days look like this for me, but -hmm. you know, some days don't look the same. So I think it's so important that we do keep that in mind. And you know, there are really great books that do portray this information, but we need to make sure that, as you said, like there needs to be more books that show the diversity of people with different ability levels. Mm -hmm. And speaking of books, um, do you have any recommendations about uh, good good examples of current books in in literature or literature that uh, show disabilities? Definitely. So, I, when I was speaking at the NJEA convention, we got in this conversation of picture books and young adult books, because they are different. The young adult books can be read to our younger learners, but they need an adult's assistant. And we want to make sure that we do have picture books available too, that um, children can just pick up and, you know, read it and then have a conversation with someone. So some, one of my favorite picture books, and you know, when I was doing my research, this was one of the most well-written books is My Brother Charlie, that's by Holly Robinson Pete and Ryan Elizabeth Pete. Have you read it? Uh, yes, that was one of the books that we read uh, for our Jake's Place story time, and Holly Robinson Pete is someone I am trying to get on this podcast. <laughs> yes, that, I'm here advocating for yes. that. I was listening, which inspired me too. <laughs> yes. Love it. That would be awesome. But uh, yeah. I thought that was such a great book because it's told from a sibling's perspective. So, right. you know, I think that's so great and it addresses the topic of autism. But shockingly, there are not as many picture books available as we would think, right? So um, a book like Thank You, Mr. Faulkner by Patricia Polacco. I know that's one of the first books I read as well. That's about a teacher helping a student with dyslexia. So that's great to have that conversation. As we know, Dr. Temple Braden is a great advocate for individuals with autism. So there's two different picture books. Uh, The Girl Who Thought in Pictures, which is the story of Dr. Temple Braden by Julia Finley Mosca. And then another text about Dr. Temple Braden is How to Build a Hug, Temple Braden and Her Amazing Squeeze Machine, which is by Amy Guglielmo and Jacqueline Toraville. So I think those are some great children's books that are well written based on my evaluative criteria and really and you know we also need to consider the illustrations for children's text so these texts show that individuals with disabilities are like everyone else this is their thought process this is their feelings this is how they adjust so those are some great texts and i was really surprised when i did my research that i did see that more texts are available for young adults. So I think it's so important that we do continue to read those texts and make sure that we encourage students to read them because some of them you do, if you're looking on the internet, you really have to research. And when I did present at the NJEA convention, we were all talking about recommendations. So something like Insignificant Events in the Life of a Cactus by Dusty Bulling, that is a text about a character with a physical impairment. So I think that's something that is so great. And you know, that can transfer uh, throughout different situations for readers. Another great text is El Depo by C.C. Bell, which is a graphic novel 
people about a character with a hearing impairment. And I think for, you know, so many of us, even reading young adult texts, the graphic novels are just so cool. Like they're really cool to teach. They're really cool to read. You feel like you're reading a comic book, which is awesome. So that is a great text and hearing impairments, you know, this is some Thing that is so common in our society. We're even noticing it more now with COVID when we're wearing masks, right? We go out somewhere. I'm like, I have no idea what, you know, anyone's saying we must read lips so much. Right. So it's important, even something as simple as now we have masks that have, you know, the square in them. So if someone does have a hearing impairment, they are able to read lips. So, you know, this text is great. Curious Incident of a Dog in the Nighttime by Mark Haddon. That is a great text about autism. I read that when I was in college. I remember that was one of the first texts that, like, Wonder, I was really able to read about a character with a disability. That was a uh, play on Broadway as well, which was amazing. So that's a great text to keep in mind. And then um, Out of My Mind by Sharon M. Draper, that's a text about a character with cerebral palsy. So we, with some of these recommendations, and there are some more, we do have some strong books that do avoid stereotypes and portray the disabilities that characters can have and that are in our society, but we still want to have more, for sure. Yes, yeah, those are great, um, great titles, for sure, and I've seen, um, I haven't read most of them, but I have seen them, uh, you know, for sure, in the bookstore and uh, on Amazon. So I'm definitely going to uh, be reading a lot this, uh, this winter. <laughs> definitely. With Amazon, especially being from home, right? We're so yes. quick to add it to the car. If we can have time to read, it's perfect. Yeah, yeah, definitely. That and uh, audio books. I've been uh, reading a lot, uh, getting a lot of books read through uh, audio books lately. So that's uh, gave me some new suggestions. So thank you. <laughs> so glad. <laughs> um, so you have mentioned that you are currently writing a book. Can you give us some information about that? A little bit more information, I should say, about that book and, uh, you know, what, whatever you can share with us. Can you uh, share that with us? <laughs> Yeah, definitely, for sure. So as I mentioned earlier in our discussion, when I was in college, I decided to research disabilities in children's literature. And of course, when we all have research projects, there are certain requirements. And the suggestion was you can have a creative piece with your research. I remember thinking, what could I do? Similar to what you're saying, I was thinking, could I have a read aloud of one of the great texts that I read? What should I do? And I remember I met with my advisor and I said to her, I think I'm going to write a children's book. And at this point, I only had a few weeks left. And she said, you're going to do what? I said, yeah, I think I'm going to go for it. I'm going to write a children's book along with my 15 other credits I was taking at the time, right? But I'm so happy I did because you know, as I conducted my research, I found so many things that I was thinking, if I wrote a book, I would want to include this. So my book is called Sometimes, and the title really reflects the evaluative criteria about people with disabilities, no one is the same. So sometimes this happens, sometimes other things happen, right? And I actually just got some of the first copies. I'll show it to you there, which is super exciting, right? So exciting. <laughs> so exciting. I can't wait. So hopefully it should be available in early 2021. But what it is about, it's about a child named Samantha, and she is an Asian American young child, and she has autism. And something I notice in a lot of the texts when I was doing my research, and although this has become better throughout time, a lot of texts are written in the third person perspective about disability. So something like a family member or a classmate. And I said, you know, I want to, based on my research, try to write a book that shows a child's point of view. That way other children with autism are able to, to identify with this character of Samantha. So what I did was I talk about Samantha's day, a typical day in her life, and I include her family and her leaving from her home to transition to her school day and 
discussing how she could sometimes be overwhelmed at school, as we all are at some points in our day, even adults during work, we can become overwhelmed. And she talks about socializing with her friends as well, and just reflects on the idea that she has autism and everyone who has autism is different but they have people who support them. Because we wanna echo that idea, as I said earlier, that society is working to better support those with different abilities. We have a long way to go. There's a lot that needs to be done, but we want everyone to know, especially young children who are reading this text, there are people who are here for you. So I was really excited. I wrote this in college and then, you know, time passed, I was adjusting to teaching. And as I was teaching, especially as a special education teacher, I experienced the same frustration that so many other teachers do is, you know, I have a child with autism in my class and I want to make this a learning moment, reading a book, but I can't find one easily. You know, I have mm -hmm. to find it somewhere else or go to a library three towns away, which should not be the case. So what I did was I did edit my book based on my teaching experience and, you know, anything to make it more relevant. Like I know technology has changed since I wrote the book. So I talked about students using technology and then I'm so grateful I was able to get it published. And we're currently, you know, we just began printing the copies and it should be available on Amazon and Barnes and Noble. But I think the most important thing is so often with children's books, people are like, okay, I'll read that to my you know, child or I'll read that to my class. But we can all benefit from reading a children's book. It's just like a Disney movie. You know, it's something right. that's nostalgic and you feel good after reading it and it teaches you a life lesson. So I hope that this book will teach children, young adults, families, adults how to better support someone and this book is specifically about autism but you know we want to think how we can better support people with disabilities within our society i love the title of the book because and i think that in itself is you know although the subject of the book is autism i think that in itself, the the whole premise of sometimes this and sometimes that, uh, I think that's a life lesson for everybody to, to learn too. <laughs> Definitely. I totally you can, agree. Because <laughs> you can apply it to so many things. I mean, I, I just said it myself. Sometimes I use my wheelchair, sometimes I use my crutches, you know, and, and sometimes, you know, sometimes my body hurts and sometimes it hurts a little more. <laughs> <It's> just, <laughs> A hundred percent. No, I completely agree, especially in this, you know, era that we're in that every single day we're having to be so flexible, right? As you yes. and I were talking, we were saying day by day, things are changing. We can go outside. We can't go outside. You know, now we're wearing masks. So I think that word sometimes is so powerful and it's a great way, especially because I would recommend this for maybe students preschool through third grade. And I think it's such a great way to help young learners understand that not everyone with autism or disability is the same. Yeah, that's so great. It's just, um, and, and like the word sometimes, it's like such a simple word, but it's so, <laughs> in, in the in the context of your book, it's like, it makes so much sense. Like, it's so true. <laughs> I'm so glad. You know, it's so great because so much children's literature, you can see it's repetitive and that often helps children to understand a concept or better associate words. So I was thinking when I was writing this book, what word can I use to really get children to understand? You know, there's so often many people relate autism to puzzle pieces and things like that. I was thinking, what can I do? And then all of a sudden, when I looked at all the pages, I said, I use sometimes, I counted up how many times I used it, it was a lot. So I figured that was the perfect title. Yeah, that's great. I'm excited for you to uh, have that out soon. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm so excited too. Hopefully I will let you know as soon as the link is available and 
hopefully a lot of people enjoy it and it helps them to spark a conversation. You know, we have to do what we can to uh, spread the word about, you know, about books. I, I love reading. I have a, a huge uh, bookshelf. And, and as I mentioned, I am getting more into audiobooks these days just because it's easier to, you know, I can type on my computer and, and listen to the audiobook at the same time. So um, I have one last question that I always end my uh, podcast episodes with. And that is, what do you want the world to know about those who live with disabilities? Sure. So I think, you know, around the word disabilities, there is a stigma and there shouldn't be, right? Because the core root of that word is abilities. And we all have different ability levels, you know, and this changes on a daily basis for all of us. We have things that we're really great at and are easy for us during the day. And then we have things that we struggle with, especially right now with COVID-19, this is changing daily. And what I really want people to know um, about people with disabilities is the best way that we can create a more inclusive society is by practicing empathy. So see where the person with the disability is coming from and see their point of view. Instead of just thinking sympathy, like, oh, I understand, right? Put yourself in their shoes and think about what's important for them. Something as simple as we said earlier as having access to a playground, right? Or being able to go to school every day. These are things that we have to make sure that we keep in mind. And I think, you know, instead of passing judgment, we need to make sure that we learn from one another. Because as I mentioned earlier, through my work with different in individuals of different ability levels, I have learned so much about the world. And that's our whole goal, is to make this world a better place for each other. So I really think that we need to look at all the positives, educate ourselves, and create this environment of inclusivity. Great answer. I loved it. I love the, the empathy part and um, the empathy and being able to learn from each other and just to, uh, as I, I tell the students I speak to, get to know someone who is different than you. You know, just talk to somebody who's different than you. That can mean anything. That can mean you have a different eye color, hair color, you know, anything. Just get to know somebody who looks different than you and, and just you know, find out what you have in common. It's, um, you know, and you will find out you have a lot in common <laughs> a lot of times. And, uh, you know, a lot of the same interests and, uh, you know, whether it be books or, um, you know, video games or, or whatever, you, you find out that, you know, our, our, we have more in common and more similarities than differences most of the time. And it's just, um, you know, we all can learn from everyone that we encounter. And that's a great, um, it's a great thing uh, to mention and a great way to end this episode. I really, um, I think that's a, a really good, good message to send out. So <laughs> thank you so I much. I'm so glad. Thank you so much for having me, Arthur. It was yes. such an honor. I, we had a great conversation, really. Yes, so it was really was. It really is. Um, you know, it really is eye-opening, I think, uh, for me as a person who lives with a disability, of course, I am aware of the lack of uh, characters with disabilities in, um, you know, in literature and, and movies and, and a lot of places. And it's important to have these conversations and to make people aware that, uh, you know, for, for people who are uh, raising children, that have disabilities that there are books out there that exist. There are, you know, can be difficult to find. Thankfully, um, as we mentioned with the use of technology and Google and Amazon uh, and other search engines, it's easier to uh, locate these with the help of, you know, the, the keywords that you can put in uh, these days. So it's, uh, you know, you don't have to, as you mentioned, you don't have to go to a library that's three towns away to, <laughs> to find it. <laughs> Uh, you know, and ordering it on Amazon, it can be uh, at your doorstep, you know, in the next two days. <laughs> so, so great, right? We're so yeah. lucky. With that. Yeah. So it's, it's, um, it's really great to have this conversation with you and um, I wish you the best of luck. I will definitely be in touch. This is not the last time you will hear from me. <laughs> 
And I'm so glad. I want to keep in touch as well. Definitely. Yes. I'm going to sign up for all email notifications. Anything you send out, I want to be updated. I'll listen to all the podcasts. And I think, you know, it's so great to have allies and just to put our resources together. You know, the yes. more we can get out there, the better it is for the future. Yeah. And that's the thing too. We, you know, we touched on it earlier that, you know, it's not a, it's not a competition or anything. It's like, we're all allies. We're all working to achieve the same goals. Like, so why not work together? A hundred percent, right? Like, let's just take those resources, put them in one place and make it available. And I think yeah. the more knowledge we provide, the better. So we are, we're all trying to advocate a little bit more, right? Yeah. So we're, you know, we're all doing great things and um, I'm so glad to have connected with you and thank you again for your time and I will be in touch with you soon. <laughs> of course. I'll be, thank your friend as well for putting us in touch. That was so I, awesome. I will for sure. And you have a good night and I'll talk to you soon. Talk to you soon. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.